This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice to be glad in it. For call to worship will you please read the <coughs> responsibly. The heavens are telling the glory of May our worship we reflect, reflect God's, God's glory. May uh, the firmament proclaim God's handy. May, May we see each, each other as the handiwork of God. Let our prayer and praise, our singing and proclamation, project the love of God. Let, Let us worship, worship together. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this wonderful morning and grand opportunity to worship. We gladly surrender our lives to you in worship and praise and praise. Build us all a deep respect for one another so that this church may be. Dear Lord, help us to be humble, kind, gentle, and be more Christ like. Come dwell in our midst, equip us, challenge us, comfort us, teach us, inspire us as we learn about more about your majestic. We pray that we be with Pastor Rob. Speak through him as he brings a message. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is the third Sunday of Lent, and Lent, as you know, it's a time when we uh, re-examine our lives and try to figure out how we can do better to make ourselves more worthy by purifying ourselves and our hearts. And both of today's praise songs are about just that. So let's sing together first, Refiner's Fire. Please stand.
Uh, there are envelopes on the table outside uh, if you so desire to give. Your America for Christ offering impacts and transforms lives across the United States and Puerto Rico. For example, this money has helped families who have lost their homes to floods, helped children living in poverty, and provided college and seminary students with scholarships. In addition, this money has provided funds for disasters such as the wildfires in California, tornadoes in the Midwest, and hurricanes in Florida, Texas, and Puerto Rico. We have been answering God's call to heal broken families and communities as well as cultivate strong Christian leaders and equip passionate disciples since 1832. We thank you for your contribution and may God bless you. And right now we have a short video. Well, I can tell you that I would not be in seminary if it weren't for the American Baptist Foundation Societies. Um, the scholarship really allows me to be able to focus on my studies. So many seminarians are struggling financially, um, and I'm just very blessed that I don't have to add that layer of concern um, to taking a full load, um, discerning the call to ministry, walking the call to ministry. All those things are really difficult for many seminarians. And this generous scholarship helps us to focus on what we will do after we graduate to make an impact on the kingdom. Not only in a financial perspective, but through mentorship and guidance and encouragement from Dr. Havre uh, to Reverend Lauren um, to even Mr. Dan Weiss um, and his family who has spoken to me and reached out to me. It's been such a blessing. It feels like I'm a part of a family that's cheering me on along the way. It keeps me encouraged. It keeps me motivated um, to earn good grades and to do well while I'm in school. Even though it's really difficult to balance everything and you know, to be working and going to school, I feel like I have such a great support system, um, not just financial support system, um, but just family support system through the American Baptist Foundation Society. joy to share. We're all here together in church. Amen. That's a nice place to be on a Sunday morning. Amen. Um, I have to confess though, I woke up and I saw the weather outside and then the weather forecast for the day and immediately my mind went to all of the things I could be doing outside around the house today. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you where you see the opportunity to maybe catch up on yard work or to get ahead on some gardening, but um, as we read our scripture readings in a moment, um, we have a commandment about honoring the Sabbath, and I'll mention that briefly in a little bit, but we're here because we choose to be, because praising God is our priority. Let's join our hearts together now as we prepare to pray. Liberating 
God and love you have set us free, free from slavery to sin, free to know you and to love you, free to follow and serve you. We praise you for your faithful love to us, for all of the many ways you have demonstrated your love to us. We see your love in the natural world around us, in the sky and the trees and the rivers. We feel your love in the warmth of the sunlight. We see your love in the gift of your commandments, the, the rules that guide our living into right relationship with you and with the people around us. And we see your love in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lived and died to bring us into life with you. Because we have experienced your love, we come before you today with confidence, bringing our needs, bringing the needs of our world, God, in your unfailing love, hear our prayers today. We pray for those who live surrounded by violence or illness, whether from war or political unrest or crime or domestic abuse, Lord, for those who find themselves victims or vulnerable. We pray that you would be their source of strength. We pray for those who find themselves involved in crime, whether by choice or through coercion, those caught up into wrongdoings, we pray for those who are in prison. We pray for our homes and for our families. We pray for parents juggling the responsibilities of work and family, for husbands and wives whose marriages are strained, for children chafing under all of the expectations laid upon them. We pray for men and women caught up in adulterous thoughts as we remember those commandments. We pray for the many people in our world who do not yet know you and have not yet experienced the new life that comes from knowing you. Merciful God, give us strength and courage to keep your commandments, to live in faithful obedience to your will. Guide our hearts and our minds from all that might distract us from living out our commitment to you. Help us to find our true worth in knowing you more fully and serving you more faithfully. In the name of Jesus Christ, our cornerstone, we pray all of these things as Christ our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our offering sentence today comes from Matthew's fifth chapter, from the Gospel according to Matthew. Let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and then give glory to your Father in heaven. If you would stand as you're comfortably able, we'll sing together our doxology hymn. to sing your praise as we now dedicate our time of offering to you forgive us Lord for all of the ways we have misused your gifts gifts of time and talents gifts of money and resources we pray that we may be transformed by your wisdom so that the gifts you have given to us may be shown to others as a way of showing your mercy and love we pray this in your son's name amen amen you may be seated this is 
scripture is taken from Exodus 21 to 7. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone who gives us who misuses his name. The second scripture is taken from 19th Psalm. The heavens declares the glory of God. The sky proclaims the works of his hand. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice go out into all the awards to the end of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes it circuit the earth. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord, Lord is perfect reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the sinner. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving lights to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the coast. By them is your servant one. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden your servant also from willful sins. May they not brood over me, then will I be blameless. In the sense of great transgression, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my Amen. Thank you. Amen. sacrificing and every week we're just trying to figure out how they did. So let's see how they did this week 
with what they are trying to do during this special season. All right, guys, are you here? Yep. Good morning, Ms. Brenda. Shalom, everyone. Hi, y'all. Morning, Ms. Brenda. How are you doing on this beautiful morning? Oh, it's just such a beautiful day, Homer. How could I be doing anything but good? I just love it. It's, um, thank you for asking me. And how about you two? How has your week been? Beautiful. To tell the truth, it's kind of hard. Malachi is quite the taskmaster. Really? Somehow putting Malachi and taskmaster in the same sentence is not something I would love to get. I beg your pardon. <laughs> After listening to your advice last week, I have done a 180. Trust me. No more pouting about food or what I don't have. Okay. Instead, I am full speed ahead to become the world's best mentor. And Homer here, that lucky nut, gets to be the recipient of my brilliance. Mm, I told Homer. The recipients of Malachi's brilliance, huh? And how do you feel about that? Well, I don't know. We've been tearing through the Old Testament this week, lots of reading and stuff. He tells me to memorize. It's really hard. And then there's a pop quizzes. What? He's giving you pop quizzes? Of course I am. How else am I supposed to know if he's learning or not? So far, because of my brilliant teaching, he's scored 100%, except on the Ten Commandments. He only got nine out of ten on those. Oh, Homer, which one did you forget? I didn't forget any of them. I can recite, recite all ten in order. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was whether I was following all ten or not. <laughs> I got a bad grade on the second one. The second one, huh? Hmm. Is that the one about uh, making graven in images? Yep. One time, my grade school art teacher had us make stuff out of clay. Okay. I made a dolphin, because I think dolphins are cool. It was painted and glazed and everything. I had it on the shelf in my room, but Malachi took off a point of my grade and told me I had to get rid of it. <laughs> You're kidding. Why? What's wrong with having a clay dolphin on your shelf? It is a violation of the second commandment, which says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. So, I told him it had to go. And while I was at it, I made Lillian put her garden gnome collection in storage too. Thank goodness for that commandment. Garden gnomes are creepy. Lillian hasn't stopped glaring at me since. Well, I don't blame her, and I feel kind of like glaring at you myself. Why? What did I do wrong? Well, how many times have I told you whenever you read a Bible verse, you've got to read the whole thing and find out what the true meaning is of the whole verse? Um, you've told me that once or twice, I think. Uh-huh, uh -huh, I think so. I'm pretty sure it's been more than once or twice, or a couple. The second commandment is the longest of all of them, and you have to read it from the beginning to the end to truly understand what God is telling us, you know, guy. Homer, you said you could re recite all ten commandments. Would you recite the second one for us, please? Sure. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, is a jealous God. Well, you can stop there. Very good, Homer. You've done your homework. And what does the first commandment say? That's easy. You shall have no other God before me. Right. And if you read those two commandments, one after the other, Mordecai, you should realize what God is telling us, that we shouldn't create idols of any kind that take the place of God in our hearts and in our minds. Right, so no clay dolphins and no garden gnomes. <laughs> <laughs> you 
It's not a sin to have a clay dolphin or garden gnomes that you decorate with. They're just pieces of art. But there is a problem if you start worshiping those things and let them take on more importance in our lives than God does. That's what God's telling us in those first two commandments. Yeah. That means I can put my clay dolphin back on the show. <laughs> um, nuts. But I guess I have to tell Lily to put those creepy gnomes back out in the garden, too. Well, if she wants to, yes. Ugh. And I think we need to say a prayer so for you and for anyone who jumps to conclusions like you do about what the Bible says before they've truly read and studied it. Should we pray? Sure. Why not? Why not? Why not? Hi. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the Bible and we have the full Bible. You know, we can't pick and choose parts of it. We need to read a full verse and get the true meaning of everything that you intend for us. Help us, to, Lord, to do that, to not just pick out the parts we like, but to understand and read all of your word. We pray for this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Miss Brenda. Um, I guess this means that you're the mentor now, and Homer and I are your protégés. Well, actually, I think God's the mentor, and we're all his protégés. What do you think? I like the sound of that. <laughs> you know, I do too. I'll tell you what, Homer, let's listen to this sermon and take it easy the rest of the day. No more pop quizzes. And it's, we'll be following the commandment number one until we do that, or number four, when we do that. Bye all. Shalom kids. See you next week. Bye everybody. Week. See you next week. See you. Bye. If you would join me, we'll sing together our hymn of preparation as we prepare to go deeper into God's word. We'll sing it's hymn number 183, Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
God, as we remember the commandments, the rules you have given us to guide our lives, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. So the theme, not just for today, but really through all of Lent, is back to basics. Back to basics. And when I was learning to play that instrument, when I began taking piano lessons at was about six or seven years old, I quickly learned to hate that saying, back to basics, because it meant when my piano teacher said it, that no matter what fun music I might be working on, it was going to be a day of focusing on posture, hand position, and scales. Huh. Oh, I hated that phrase, back to basics. And then when I was a little bit older, I started playing soccer. I know, I have the physique of a soccer player, right? <laughs> I did it one time. I played soccer for eight years, back to basics. When the coach said that, oh my gosh, that meant wind sprints, ball handling, very basic kind of stuff. I hated the fundamentals. But if you watch basketball, especially in the last few days, on Tuesday night, you saw Illinois mop the floor with Michigan by using fundamentals, basics. They didn't just outshoot Michigan, they out-rebounded Michigan. Their ball handling was spectacular. Their, their passing game was, was way above where it normally is. The fundamentals, is what, that's how Illinois won. And then yesterday, Ohio State learned the same thing. And I could just talk about Illinois basketball for a while, but Cheryl, I see you there, and I understand that this has been a hard year for Duke, and I see the Jones family in Kentucky, so we're in mixed company, so let's not blow too much about how remarkable the season Illinois is having, even though, by the way, Illinois is having a remarkable season. <laughs> Back to basics. But you know, it's not just in music or athletics, in our spiritual discipline, Sometimes it's good to go back to those basic foundational practices too. Basic foundational practices like prayer and fasting, almsgiving, uh, basic things like worshiping and praising God daily, not just on Sundays. These are the things that our entire religion is built on. This is what our faith is built on. And just like with a house or any other building, if the foundation is not strong, whatever we build on top of it is not going to be very strong either. So in that light, today we are going back to basics in our faith because this is what we do during Lent. And this is our back to basics time before we celebrate the resurrection at Easter. And our reading from Exodus today gets us started on one of the most basic lists that as Homer and Malachi were talking about, probably a lot of us learned as children in Sunday school. Our reading from Exodus stopped after only the first couple commandments, but I'm going to go talk about all ten of them today. If you want to reference them, you know where they are. They're in the 20th chapter of Exodus, and you can just keep reading after Rathon left off. But our list begins with one we've probably all heard before. We hear it repeated in the New Testament, and Jesus tells us it is the most important commandment of all, the greatest commandment in Matthew's Gospel, we hear Jesus say it as, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, sometimes all your soul, depending on the translation. In other words, love the Lord your God with everything you've got. Jesus says that is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with everything you've got. And that doesn't mean that we merely acknowledge the Lord's existence. That doesn't mean that we worship God only on Sunday mornings or when it's convenient. It means that everything we do, everything we are, we recognize that it is that way because of God. In the New Testament, we read, God in whom we live and move and have our being. We cannot exist apart from God. That God knows us, God loves us, God calls us to follow him, God warns us sometimes, God cheers alongside of us, God counsels us, God pleads with us to come closer, to follow, to trust, God forgives us. God is a being who is never absent from us, who continually sustains our lives and gives our lives meaning and he upholds us and he gives us gifts, gifts to use to benefit other people and to praise his own holy name, and this is the God that we are to bow down before and worship, not because God demands it from us, from us, but because we ought to love God enough and realize what God has given us that we should 
really have no other desire than to bow down before God. I think if we were to ask the Hebrew people who first received these commandments, they would say it like this. Everything we are, everything we have is from God. Therefore, everything we are and everything we have ought to be used in praise of God. Bow down before God because the love of God is what sustains our very lives. The second commandment, that's the one about idols, that's the one that, that uh, Malachi and Homer talked about, gives us some insight of things to avoid. When it comes to bowing down before God, we have to remember that God is a jealous God. God doesn't like it when we divert our time or attention elsewhere. So God says, don't let anything else come before me. Sometimes that's an idol. Some of our Old Testament religious ancestors struggled with that. I think sometimes today we still do. We allow things to come between us and God. But any time we forget that God is God, that's a violation of this second commandment. You see, we break this commandment by simply forgetting that God is God. We break this commandment by allowing ourselves to think too casually of God. When we allow our minds to imagine God in human form, with human characteristics, somebody that can be my buddy or my friend, we've taken the reverence, the holiness out of God. The second commandment is our reminder that we can't visualize God, we can't draw God, we can't sculpt God. Our minds are not capable of understanding the fullness that is God. Therefore, to do so would break the second commandment. The second commandment is about having reverence for God and remembering that God is far beyond anything we could imagine for ourselves. The third commandment, we didn't cover this in our reading, but like I said, I'm going to go on. The third commandment, that's the one about taking the Lord's name in vain, which when I was a kid meant don't say bad words. But there's more to it than that. This commandment forbids perjury or false testimony. It also forbids unnecessary oaths. You should never have to swear by God's name that something is true. Just be an honest person of integrity. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We don't have to swear something on God's name. It's not our name to swear on. And likewise, we should always hold in, in deep reverence God's church, the scriptures, everything that serves God. Those are not ours to take an oath on. So, so the commandment here, the teaching is that God's house, his temple, his book, his laws, his prophets, his ministers, everything that serves God should be approached with the reverence because that's what God calls us to do when we, when we remember that God's name itself is holy. Everything that God has created is holy. The fourth commandment, boy, that's one we break a lot. Honor the Sabbath. That's the one about Sabbath. So we come to now things that are not necessarily part of our faith, but part of our daily living. We have teachings galore about what to do in our religion, but now we get to the first commandment that deals with stuff outside our religion. Things like work and how we spend our leisure time and our labor, and these things are addressed here in this commandment. We are to dedicate one day each week, one out of seven, to simply resting and being in God's presence. Oh, how hard should that be, right? How hard should it be? We are an active people, right? We have jobs and families and commitments. We have active children or grandchildren who require a lot of our time and attention and are involved in numerous extracurricular activities. So does this commandment mean we have to stop all of that for one day a week and just simply sit and stare at a wall? Not necessarily, no. What it does mean, though, is that one day a week, typically observed on Sunday in our religion, one day a week, we have to avoid all of the stress and the worry and the anxiety that our normal daily or weekly activities would place upon us. One day a week, our time and attention is not focused on what I need to get done, but simply giving God the praise he's due. One day a week, we have to recharge our spiritual batteries by stopping ourselves being working so hard. You know, we have to stop the machine so that we can plug it into the charger. That's the image here. One day a week to rest, allowing God to restore us and to refill us. We enjoy this one day a week with family or friends, and we can still do things to be productive on this one day a week, but productivity is not the goal. 
The goal is to focus on being in God's company. Doing these things will remind us that God is always with us. And the really neat thing about this particular commandment is it's not just a suggestion for stress-free living. This is a biblical commandment. God says you must take one day a week and set aside all of the stuff that normally keeps you busy and distracts you. One day a week, give to God. The fifth commandment, that's the one about honoring our parents. Now, first let me say, as a matter of practicality, as a matter of truth, that nobody's parents are perfect, except for my children's. No. <laughs> nobody's parents are perfect, and Ella and Ben and Evan, you know that. You will know that more as you age. Nobody's parents are perfect. We make mistakes. Each one of us, our parents, have earned merits and demerits. They've tried, they have failed, they have succeeded. Parenting is tough, amen? Amen. If you've been on both sides of it, you know it's tough. Setting all that aside though, there are some truths here that we can agree on. For their age and their experience, we honor our parents. Because no matter how good or bad they could have been or were, no matter what they should have done differently or didn't, our parents know that just like us, life is difficult sometimes. And if anything, they know it more because they lived a lot longer ago or a lot longer within us. The benefits that they have conferred upon us. Our personalities are in some part biological, so some piece of who you are today, the good and the bad, comes from your parents. Let's focus on the good and thank them for that. And we honor them for their love, even if they didn't or don't show it the way we'd like them to. As a rule, I believe parents generally speaking, love their children more than their children could ever possibly understand. I think that's just kind of how it works. Sometimes parents don't always show that. I think parents generally make sacrifices for their children that their children will probably never ever realize or appreciate or reciprocate. And if we have parents, all of us, or had parents living at one time, that means we were the beneficiary of that at some point in our lives. And for that, we can honor our parents. Even if we saw it or didn't see it, the love they had for us. The sixth commandment, that's the one about murder. Now to that one, most of us would probably say, well, you yeah, know, that's no problem. I don't intend on killing anybody this week. I think I can check that off my list as pass, right? But not only are murder and violence prohibited in this commandment, angry thoughts are sins. That's where murder begins. It begins in the heart. Murder doesn't begin with a weapon. It's not a sin of the hands. Murder begins as hurt or fear, and it festers into anger. And that anger festers and grows into violent thoughts. And those violent thoughts can fester and grow into physical altercations. All of that begins right here in the heart. So this commandment tells us that not only violence to the body, but injury to the soul is of concern. Anger and bitterness, that's how we violate that commandment. The seventh commandment, the one about adultery. So here we have some commentary, and if you look in Exodus 20, you'll see that there's some additional commentary with this one, explaining the detail of this commandment and what it ought to mean to us. Not only adultery, but impurity of any kind. In fact, what we think, what we feel, what's going on in our minds and in our hearts. If these thoughts, if these feelings are impure or dishonorable, that's the sin. That's how we violate this commandment. Simply thinking about someone as a means of physical gratification, that's adultery, that's a sin. Um, and so all in all, this commandment speaks to our need to be pure and right, not only in our actions, but also in our thoughts and in our hearts. And just like the one about murder before it, this commandment can be broken without any act ever actually taking place. It all begins in the heart. The Eighth Commandment, that's the one about stealing. I tend to be maybe a little naive because I like to think that most people don't go around stealing. I like to think that most people are more honest than that, and we know that we shouldn't take things that don't belong to us. That's, that's direct stealing. But indirect stealing is maybe a little more challenging. Maybe that's something more of a problem. Concealment of deficits, misrepresenting quality. 
using false weights or measures, any form of deception during any kind of transaction, that counts as stealing, you know. It's not just a pickpocketing or shoplifting sin here. As a matter of biblical commandments, as a matter of theology, anything up to and including being dishonest on your taxes counts as stealing or failing to mention that the air conditioner doesn't always work on that used car that you're selling. That counts as stealing, you know. Um, it's considered stealing if you have more resources than you need and you refuse to share them with those who need. <clears throat> According to the New Testament, that's considered stealing too. Lord help us, yeah. The ninth commandment, the one about false witness, Bearing fault with a false witness, now that generally makes me think of courtroom dramas like Law and Order. I used to love watching that show. When Julie and I were first married, that was our binge show before binge watching was a thing. Is this cutting in and out? No, it's a little bit. We're going to switch to red. Law and Order. Jack McCoy, New York prosecutor. Did you ever watch Law and Order? I was a Lenny Briscoe fan. I love that detective. Snarky, sarcastic jaded. That's my kind of cop, right? <laughs> Law and order. That's Now, that's what I thought of when I think of uh, false witness or perjury, because how many times did I see McCoy grilling a witness on the stand, threatening perjury if they weren't 100% honest? The reality is most of us will probably live our whole lives having never experienced what it's like to sit on a, on a courtroom witness stand, because that's not something that happens to most people. But there are other ways that we can give false witness or false testimony. Think about this for a minute. If you overhear someone talking about how wonderfully kind their neighbor was, you may or may not pay attention to that. But if you overhear someone talking about what a jerk their neighbor was, boy, your ears are going to perk right up for that. It's something about how we're wired. We love hearing stories about the sinners, not the saints necessarily. There's something about that, uh, that destruction of character that intrigues us. When somebody has something bad to say about someone else, we like to hear what it's all about. And this is a form of false witnessing because we see this all too often. When we get mad at someone, instead of just confronting them and dealing with it one to one, it's become a very natural thing to assault their character and to do it publicly. Instead of sharing the beef I have with someone directly to them, I'll go to everyone else I know and tell them what a lousy so-and-so that guy is, right? That's false witness when we berate people, when we downgrade who they are as a human because of what they've done, we are bearing false witness against them. And the 10th commandment, that's the one about coveting. Now on the surface, this commandment seems like a precursor to one of the others, maybe adultery or stealing. After all, coveting generally leads to those things. But there's a different reason, I think, that this commandment finishes out our list and remains its own commandment. Coveting is the only of the Ten Commandments that can be broken only in our hearts. Coveting is the only of the commandments that we can't do an action to. It's only in our hearts. Because this commandment reminds us, if we haven't picked up on it already, that the thoughts of our hearts, what goes on in our minds, that's all covered by God's law too. It's not just how we conduct ourselves, but it's actually what we think and what we feel that are covered by God's law. The private thoughts of our hearts, God is very much concerned about those things. So it's important to remember that God not only sees what we do, but God sees those private innermost thoughts thoughts, and since covetousness and greed are the root causes of so much evil in the world, so much evil, God addresses this one specifically. Now, does it mean that we can't have nice things? No, of course not. Does it mean that we can't aspire for some earthly comfort? No, of course not. But to be covetous, to be coveting means to be completely dissatisfied with what God has provided. To always wish we had what our neighbor had. To always wish we had something more than what God has blessed us with. To covet is the opposite of being content. All of these rules, these basic rules for faithful living together. When we take the time to go back to basics, 
to review this list and then to look honestly at ourselves. Perhaps then the prayer of today's psalm rings out especially true. Our psalmist today says, Cleanse me from my hidden faults, O Lord, and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, my Lord, my Rock, and my Redeemer. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, it is a good opportunity sometimes to go back to basics, to go back to those very foundational things that you've ask your people to do or to not do. It's a helpful reminder, Lord, that you've called us to some very basic, simple things, and yet, because of our complacency, our apathy, our lack of discipline, whatever it is, Lord, we've strayed, we've sinned, we've missed the mark. And God, as we review this basic list, this list of ten simple rules for living, we can identify the ways that we've both succeeded and failed, but more than anything, Lord, we can identify that you forgive us. You call us back to your presence. You redirect us and realign us and send us out again in the right direction. And we pray, Lord, that that's what's happened here today as we've reviewed these commandments. Lord, help us to understand your commandments are not to be a burden, but a joy, a way that brings us closer to you. Let these rest on our hearts this week as we go out into the world as ambassadors of your love and your grace. We pray all of these things in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. If you would uh, stand with me as you're comfortably able, we'll sing our hymn of commitment without him, and we'll use this as a time to prepare our hearts for communion together. If you haven't yet picked up a communion cup, they're in the basket at the back of the church.
like to go ahead and begin opening your cup. Um, we've used these before, but it's never, I don't know if that makes it easier necessarily. Remember the top layer is clear. That's the layer that covers the wafer and that's the harder one to open. The purple layer is the one that covers the juice. So as you're preparing your cups, let's, uh, let's pray together. God, as we hold in our hands these symbols of your body and blood, we remember that we come to this table today not because we deserve to be here, not because we've earned it, but because you offer it to us freely. You ask us to be honest with ourselves and with you about our faults. You call us to a time of redirection or realignment. You gift us with your forgiveness and your love. And Lord, when we really consider how truly undeserving we are, it can be downright humbling to come before this table. So today we come with a spirit of genuine thanksgiving, opening our hearts to you in praise and worship, knowing that without your love and without your forgiveness, we are nothing. Move among us as we celebrate this time of communion today. May your spirit be present here with us as you've called us into this place at this time. May these symbols, this cup, this wafer, this juice, be more than mere symbols. May it be a true reminder of your real presence with us in our lives. We pray all of these things in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and shared it with his friends and said unto them, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he passed the cup among his friends, explaining this cup is the symbol of the new covenant poured out for all of mankind, the covenant that forgives our sins. Take in the same way, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus says, however often we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we do so proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. Let us proclaim the truth of God's love for us in a prayer. We'll pray together in unison. The words are on the screen. Will you join me? Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. Most merciful of God, take our hands, which have held that which is consecrated, and work through them. Take our lips, which have tasted the signs of the body and blood of our Lord, and speak through them. Take our bodies, which have received the bread and wine, and make them fit temples of your spirit. Take our minds and mold them, that our thoughts may be your thoughts. Take our hearts and fill them with your love, that we may truly serve you in the world. Amen. If you would stand as you're comfortably able, we'll sing together our final hymn, our hymn of unity, We'll sing the first verse of Blessed Be the Tide that Binds. of our Lord God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, guide you, and sustain you in the days to come. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.